today's session will be on designing the artificial lift system with gas issues. But before starting the session, we would like to introduce our instructor engineer, Luis Guancas. He's a petroleum engineer from Sir Columbiana University with a specialization in project management from Industrial University of Santander. Engineer Guancas works as a technical service leader at Odessa Separator Incorporated and been involved with SPE. Mr. Guancas currently have five SPE papers and 14 SWPSC papers. Uh, Mr. Guancas, you can uh, use your share screen right now. Perfect. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I appreciate really this, um, this invitation you guys made to our company. Uh, it is really an honor to be uh, at this presentation. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. okay. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Perfect. Uh, so, well, again, thank you very much. This is a really good opportunity uh, for you guys to relate with the oil industry. You know, this uh, sometimes it's really difficult to start in this um, in this life uh, in the oil industry. Every day, everything is more challenging. And I know several times maybe people mention this, but uh, you gotta be more prepared for what is coming. And this kind of webinar are really helpful because of the interaction. So I want to invite you all to ask any question at any point. I mean, it's fine. We can interact and try to solve all the questions. Uh, if we don't have the answer, we'll try to find out. Uh, we'll try to find the right answer for any question. So this is an invitation. Don't be shy. Ask anything you need. And then, uh, that's perfect. So Hassan said, it's not still, you, you guys can see my screen or, or you can? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Oh, a little bit. Sure. What about now? Yes, it's clear now. Okay, perfect. Cool. So you guys, I'm going to present this. Still, you can see it? I just present yes, it. Yes. Perfect, cool. So again, ask at any point. Uh, in the previous session, my partner Gustavo, he covered everything related with sand. Uh, he told some basis on where the problem is coming and how to solve it in the uh, rod pump and ESP, which are basically the most used system. Of course, those problems are also present in all the others artificial lift system. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna start covering the gas control solution uh, specifically in ESP. So we are gonna use the same kind of a, a methodology that he used. We are gonna start uh, checking the problem, uh, checking consequences, uh, what this problem is causing in my pump. And finally introduce uh, current solutions or typical solutions you guys can find in the oil industry. And also we are gonna see uh, the solutions we have available to complement uh, the current solutions, okay? So we will start explaining where the problem is coming from. So this is, I know you guys are very familiar with the flow regimes. So actually this is where the problem is coming when you are producing from an unconventional well. So unconventional well producing from horizontal wells have horizontal section right and have a vertical one. Normally ESPs and generally rod pumps and those kind of systems, uh, operators are using these systems at a vertical section, right? So they are gonna try to uh, set the pump as vertical as possible. You can see that they use as a reference the KOP. And from that point, moving up, they're gonna start assembly the production stream. Now, the problem is when you start producing your well, let me use this laser point. 
when you start producing your well, there is high pressure and then you can produce without pump. Some actually operators, they do prefer to complete the well using the ESP or gas lead. That depends on the plan of the operator, but you can see bubble flow, right? So gas is gonna be in solution mostly and some free gas could be just flowing together with the liquid, but that's not gonna be a big deal for your pump. So it's gonna be easily handled. The problem comes when the production uh, start and then the pressure decrease, right? At the wellbore, close uh, to the wellbore, the pressure drop is gonna be drastically high, right? So at that point, in some periods, uh, you can see the gas releasing from the liquid. And that problem relies on the free gas flow into the regime we can find on a conventional well currently is the slug flow, right? This is slug flow means the gas is coming from package, right? And then is achieving your pump, is reaching your pump, and then uh, at a certain point, your pump is only producing gas. And that creates uh, sort of a huge problem. Now, going a little bit back, this is where the problem is really coming from, the horizontal section. So the horizontal section has these flow regimes that we're showing here that depends uh, on the gas velocity versus the liquid velocity, right? And the gas also, uh, like you know, is gonna move faster than liquid. So when you have free gas on your horizontal section, the gas is gonna move faster. In when the gas reaches the curve and the horizon and the vertical section of your well, the gas is gonna flow faster and then it's gonna leave behind the liquid. This is a pretty cool video. This is an experience uh, we made with Texas Tech University at Lubbock, Texas. Uh, our purpose was to try to like understand how the slug and flow behave in your will. And we came up with this really cool experience. Let me mute it. So on the video, you can see how the gas slugs are moving super fast. So at the horizontal section, they are moving super fast and they are carrying some liquid, right? But the problem with this is at the horizontal section is fine, but when the gas and the liquid reaches the curve, right? And the vertical section, that creates a problem. And the problem is uh, the flow back. Liquid is flowing back, it's falling down like a waterfall, and then the gas is actually flowing out and then it reaches your pump. So you can see right here how the gas is moving super faster. The liquid is falling down and then flowing downwards, the opposite direction that's supposed to flow, right? And then the gas is the one flowing faster and going to the vertical section. If you see here, most of the fluid that you can see here is gas. Well, can't see it theoretically because it's kind of invisible, but the gas is the one that reaches, that reaches the pump faster. So a pump, like a, an, ESP, an ESP, that's supposed to produce liquid mostly because it's how they operate, producing only gas, that's a big deal. That's a big deal, that's a problem. Uh, that's a huge problem that all the operators worldwide are dealing with currently, okay? So let's, let's move. Uh, this is a real production graphic of what happened in a will completed with an ESP. So at the beginning, like I was explaining to you at the beginning, uh, fluid production is really high, pressure is high, right? But when the production, the liquid production decreases, also the pressure decreases, the gas is gonna start to release it like this. Let me use the last point. So here you see how maybe we overcome too much the bubble pressure. Uh, we are so below it. And the gas rate, the red one, which is this one, start increasing. Liquid, which is uh, blue and green. So it's gonna start to get like an stable behavior, which is gonna be compatible or which is gonna match with the pump capacity, right? 
So sometimes at this point, the operator just uh, pull the wheel, they change the ESP, and they use this uh, ESP that matches with the well potential. So at this point, the problem is the gas is too high because we are so low pressure. And uh, again, this translates on gas being produced by the pump and then creating these problems. So this is the first problem we're gonna talk briefly about gas free around the ESP. So the motor cooling, how the motor cooling works downhole? Well, this motor cooling depends on the fluid velocity. Theoretically, the fluid velocity around the motor should be higher than one feet per second. That's uh, the rule of thumb. Uh, that depends of the kind of fluid that is flowing around. And this is the most important factor, uh, the type of fluid. If the fluid is liquid, that's fine. That's how the motor was designed to be cooled for, liquid, right? But when the gas is the one flowing around the motor, that's a big problem because the gas is not so efficient to uh, transfer the heat from the motor to the space, right? So uh, what happened here is a poor motor cooling. When the gas is around the motor, the pump, the motor is going to start to heat it up to heat it up. And then this translates on multiple chunk downs. So at surface, the pump is gonna have some, uh, the BSD and some, oh, we'd say like um, prevention problem mechanism that are gonna prevent uh, the motor to fail. Like they set a threshold of the temperature. So let's say normally temperature can go above 250 Fahrenheit. So if the pump overcome that threshold 250 Fahrenheit, uh, the BSD at surface is gonna shoot down the motor at the bottom, right, at bottom hole. So multiple shutdown. Every time that the motor achieve a temperature above the threshold, above that line, uh, all the systems gonna shut down. And that's a short term. Uh, long term, that uh, the run life of the motor is gonna be shorter. So we're gonna have to face a failure, premature failure of the motor, because all the components are gonna be overheated and that's gonna reduce the, the operational life, the operational life of the motor. So this is the first problem we need to consider. Another problem related with this one is a uh, scale deposit. When you increase temperature, uh, many inorganic components are going to be deposited. Uh, calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, well, etc. That depends on the uh, water condition, right? So what happened here is you're increasing temperature, you are decreasing solubility of those components and promoting uh, scale deposition around the motor. So the scale is going to be deposited around the motor and in the pump. It's going to produce plugging issue in the pump and in the intake. That's another critical point. And in my motor, it's going to create like a film that is going to start increasing more and more the temperature. So first problem, uh, poor motor cooling. Second problem, and I think this is very critical also in terms of production, gas lock. So when the gas is locked, getting to the pump, like this picture, you're seeing here the pump intake, getting into the pump, getting into the intake and then to the pump. The gas is gonna start getting stagnant at the pump stages. So we see uh, here the impeller uh, and then the gas bubble will start building up in these sections. Now, eventually those gas pockets will be bigger, bigger and more bigger until the point that uh, the pump is gonna get locked. So here we got our first problem. Uh, gas is actually occupying volume that's supposed to be occupied by liquid. So we are reducing liquid production. Oil and water, of course, we care more about oil. So we are reducing the amount of volume that uh, the liquid that the pump can produce, right? And here with the gas log, that means the gas in, the, in those pockets is start to pressurize 
too much to the point that uh, the chaff, which is right here, that is connected to the motor, is not going to be able to move. So another mechanism that people can say that surface at the BSD uh, to prevent failure is to set certain current consumption. When the pump start, when the motor start to consume more and more current, that means the motor is doing more effort to move the pump, right? So when he's doing more effort, there is a threshold, let's say 35 amperes, right? Above that threshold, uh, it's too risky to operate and the pumps need to be shut down. So the other problem is gonna be shut down. Uh, at the most critical moment, the problem is gonna be a broken shaft. We can break the shaft because the effort the motor is doing to move those pressurized um, pump stages that are completely almost full with gas, high pressure gas. So that's the problem. Second problem we are identified, gas lock. Very important to keep in mind. The third problem, source production. And this one we already talked about uh, when I show you the gas, the video with the gas. So this is the same concept. Source production means like production is coming like a wave. So from the horizontal section to the vertical one, you are receiving a wave of uh, liquid with gas, right? So the gas is gonna move faster. So you're gonna have constantly flowing more gas than liquid. So that's surging, that gas coming from the horizontal section to the vertical one and then to the pump, that's surging production. Also something to consider and something to keep in mind. A good thing that the operator can do before uh, or when they are using an ESP or any kind of a ALS is uh, identify the type of flow regime they are having at the horizontal section. There are many methods that can be used to determine, uh, could be also theoretically, uh, but they can give you an idea or they can give to the operator, to the production engineer, an idea of uh, the problem he's facing with, and then that will help to find the enough solution for that, right? So that's pretty much. Okay, we're gonna start introducing solutions. Uh, solutions can be identified as control solutions, so things that we can do at surface or the way how we operate the well to prevent gas problems in ESP. The other kind of solutions are going to be um, devices, you know, tools that we can use even with the pump or outside the pump to prevent this problem. So first, uh, this is typically, and we can use this on rod pump, on ESP is a back pressure valve. The back pressure valve is a device that you can use both at the tubing and at the casing, both places. Mm -hmm. At the tubing, the back pressure valve is gonna set the pressure to, it's gonna increase the discharge pressure. Uh, and that will increase the pressure over my pump, over the pump stages, reducing the free gas inside, right? So higher pressure, less free gas. That's a pretty basic concept. The same thing on the casing pressure, right? The casing pressure has uh, the ability to increase the PIP, the pump intake pressure, by increasing the casing pressure, right? So the result of this is going to be less free gas at the pump intake, another way to do it. Uh, this is a very questionable method uh, we, I decided to include it because I heard this one time in a presentation at the Permian Basin, not a big fan of this, is decreasing the casing pressure. Uh, theoretically, and all the basic concept related with gas separation and gas separators, uh, they say that when you reduce PIP, you increase the separation efficiency. So what you're looking here with decrease the casing pressure, it is actually increase the separation efficiency of your gas separator. But of course, if you decrease uh, the casing pressure, you're gonna release more gas at the pump intake, right? So your gas separator is gonna be uh, like dealing with more volume of gas. 
And uh, there is no actually correlation to correlate the amount of gas with the separation efficiency of a gas separator. So there is this conflict here. Uh, these are options. I mean, uh, not a big fan of this one. I wouldn't recommend it. I just decided to put here so you guys can analyze. At any point, you may be, or you may be facing some of this problem in the future, and you will have to take decisions about this because you have your pound down hole and you need to do something to uh, increase efficiency in production. That's more important. So these are things you, you can consider. Uh, the other operational measure that you can uh, use is the VSD, the variable speed drive. Um, you can set the variables that I was explaining before. You can set current, temperature, frequency, right? Frequency. And then you can determine uh, how, what is going to be the limit, the threshold, and then when the pump needs to shoot down, right? To prevent failures. Uh, that's pretty much about these measures. Is there anyone, is there any questions so far that we can discuss about where the problem is coming and uh, maybe the measures, the operational measures you can use uh, when you are producing on an ESP and you have gas problems? So if you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand or you can, that's in the chat and we'll talk. Okay, so if there is no questions, we will move to the next slide. And this is a new topic. So we also saw how to uh, deal with gas by doing some changes in the operation. Uh, now we're gonna see how to deal with gas in your pump design. So with the ESP, there are some options that you can use to increase the capacity of the ESP to deal with the gas. So the first can solution, we, yes, sir. We have, uh, we have a question. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, can you please explain again the decrease in casing, in casing pressure as a, as a solution for gassy well in, S, um, in ESP? Okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, so like I told you before, I heard this in one presentation. Uh, there is a paper published at the Southwestern Petroleum that was like 1971, I think. I don't remember the name, but I can send you the, the, um, the paper. So theoretically, in that studio, they say uh, efficiency of a gas separator, downhole gas separator, is going to be ruled by uh, first, the geometry, sorry, geometry of the gas separator. And then here they add uh, the PIP. So at that point, uh, the concept was uh, as lower the PIP, the pumping the pressure. Uh, so you got your will here, right? You got, uh, let's go here the well head, let's say this is the well head, and this is the casing pressure, right? This is the manometer. In here, you, we can add the tubing, and let's say here is your pump. So pump. Uh, when you decrease the casing pressure, what is gonna happen with your pump intake pressure? The PIP, the PIP is going to decrease. So the same thing happened when you decrease the fluid level, uh, your PIP is going to decrease. So uh, when you decrease the casing pressure, you're going to decrease the PIP. And theoretically, your gas separator is going to be more efficient. Now, like I told you before, the problem is there is no a correlation, there is no any equation, there is no any function that relate this separation efficiency with the gas volume. So all the correlation or equations or mechanism to calculate the separation efficiency are related on fluid velocity, liquid gas velocity, but not on gas volume, right? So if I increase the gas volume from, let's say that at the PIP one, I have 3000 cubic feet of gas volume, 
when I reduce the casing pressure and I reduce the PIP, in the PIP2, I am going to have 6,000 cubic feet. So what I'm telling you is there is no any way currently to say, hey, with this increasing in the volume of gas of free gas at the pump intake, my separator is going to be able to handle it. Now, the only correlation that you can do is if you increase liquid volume, uh, liquid velocity is going to change, and then the separation efficiency is going to change. So you, need, you guys need to be very careful on doing this. Uh, like I said before, not a big fan of this. Uh, this is something I heard, but I like to come here so people can discuss. And they, try, they can try to understand how is the mechanism, how the fluids are behaving downhole, and, and that you can understand that anything you do at surface is going to have a huge impact downhole. Uh, in my opinion, it's better to keep a pressure uh, where you can keep low volume of free gas at the pump intake. So your gas separator doesn't have to handle a big amount of free gas. That's, that's a huge problem. So I hope the, this explanation uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more about this topic. Okay. Any other question or can we move forward? Okay, so if there is more question, we can we can move. Um, okay, let me change this. Yeah, we're the vortex gas separator. So this is like I told you, this is a component used by the ESP. So you can replace the ESP and use a lower tandem or a vortex gas separator like this. And this is going to be connected to the chap. So like you can guess. If it's connected to the shaft, it's going to rotate, right? So this is also called rotary gas separator, right? So this rotation is going to create a centrifugal force, right? The centrifugal force is going to push the heaviest phase, which is liquid, to the wall of the gas separator. And the lighter is going to be concentrated at the middle point, so close to the shaft. Uh, when this is happening, there is a channel that communicate the intersection of the gas separator with the annulus. So actually all the gas being separated at this gas separator is gonna be vented to the annulus. Uh, theoretical separation of this gas separator, that depends on the uh, manufacturer company, right? Mm. Somebody can tell you 25%, somebody can tell you 50%. So everything needs to be uh, related to the size of the pump, the size of the gas separator, uh, the frequency you are operating the pump. So that's something that you can uh, discuss with the, uh, the ESP company, right? Uh, it is a really good tool. I mean, it is really efficient. It helps a lot by separating the gas at the ESP. Another tool that you can use in conjunction with the ESP is a gas handler. Typically, you can install the gas handler above the vortex gas separator. So it's gonna be, you can place here the gas handler. And like the name saying, this is not going to separate the gas, right? This is gonna uh, handle the gas production. So the method how they use to handle it is uh, to put back in solution. So increase the pressure. So the free gas can go back in solution. So that's something that you can see here resolubilize. So the resolubilization of the free gas inside the liquid. So that's good because when homogeneous liquid, just one phase liquid, which is theoretically the ideal, right, passes from the intake or the gas handler to the pump, uh, the centrifugal force or yeah, the centrifugal force is going to be more effective. So you're going to be able to lift the theoretical capacity of your pump. Uh, ESP pumps are made or are designed to produce liquid, no gas. The cinetic energy that you can print on the gas is not going to be enough to produce enough discharge pressure. But the cinetic energy 
you can bring in the liquid, it is going to be enough to lift enough liquid, right? So keep in mind that ESP are designed for lift liquid, no gas. Another option. So these are actually options outside the pump. So they are no, uh, just a little, just to back up a little bit. Uh, there are other, other measures that you can use on the pump designs. Uh, there are specific type of uh, pump stages. There are a specific type of uh, uh, pumps that can handle uh, or can manage uh, the gas production, right? Uh, they are just a matter of changing the spaces on the pump between the pump stages, increasing the pressure over there, reducing the free gas. So those those concepts are also available in the oil industry market that you guys can take advantage of that and, and use it for preventing gas issues in your pump. Um, trouted ESP. What is a trout? The trout was originally developed to uh, remove motor cooling. Remember, uh, the motor cooling happens because the liquid flows around the motor. So imagine if you have perforations above your pump. Let's say, let's gonna draw something really ugly here. Okay, let's imagine this scenario. Let's say that these are not the perforations, forget about this, and let's place the perforations right here. Right here. Sorry about that awful draw. But okay, let's say production is coming from this perforation. So if we don't have any trowel like this, fluid is gonna flow downwards and it's gonna enter the pump. So what happened with the motor is the motor is gonna be run by, let's say, static fluid. So the movement in this area right here is gonna be pretty much nothing. I mean, it's gonna be a low interaction. So if my motor is gonna to start to heat it up, all the environment around my motor, if it's a static, what happened is gonna to start to heat it up, more heat. So it's gonna to start to get hotter, hotter, and eventually uh, pump is gonna shut down because of the BSD. Uh, so the trial was actually developed to force the fluid to go around the trout, right? And then enter my pump, from the bottom of the shell, right? On that way, you're, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have a liquid flowing around my motor, cooling my motor, which is the purpose of the liquid, cool the motor in this sense. Um, so let's put it here, put it here. So you know where I go. Okay. Now the fluid has to go on this direction, entering the trout. Sorry about that, and get into the pump. So I'm gonna be able to cool the motor. The other good thing about um, this concept is uh, the annular space between, the, let's call it annular space between the trout or capsule. Sometimes you can find this like ESP encapsulated uh, and the motor is going to increase because the space is gonna be narrow, is going to increase my liquid velocity. So I told you theoretically, uh, you are going to have an effective uh, heat transfer if your liquid is flowing at a flowing velocity higher than one feet per second. So theoretically, one feet per second is going to warranty uh, proper motor cooling. So with this narrow space, you are going to have that effect. Okay. So that's another good point about it. But okay, that's fine. Let's focus on what matters for us, is using the trial as a gas separator. So after this happened, another guy, he thought that maybe cool to use a trial to separate the gas. So this is the first design we're going to have to separate gas using the trial. So an inverted trial. An inverted trial is a trial set uh, you can do both. You can set the trout below the pump intake, like here, and you can trout totally the pump. The problem with this design 
is going to be the recirculation of the motor cooling again. So fluid have to go to this place and then circulate the fluid, the liquid, which is a stain right here, which is pretty much static. So you need to find a way to recirculate that so you can remove proper motor cool. Uh, in this one, the cool thing is actually the liquid is passing around the motor, cooling the motor, then it's going around the shroud and is entering the pump through the top of the shroud. So it's kind of doing a turn down and then falling like a waterfall inside the trout. So here, what you're getting is a gas separation. So the gas separation is actually happening in this space between the pump stages and the trout, right? That's, that's pretty much the concept you're using here. Um, keep in mind this, theoretically, to separate the gas downhole, your liquid velocity has to be lower than six, inch per second, 0.5 feet per second, the same thing, right? So as bigger is going to be this space in this area, this, let's say, chamber between the pump stages and the trout, uh, better is going to be the separation efficiency because we are able to reduce considerably the liquid velocity. We will elaborate a little bit more later. Uh, the other method is this one. Another option for this one is encapsulate totally this uh, trout and using a deep tube. A deep tube is a small diameter pipe which is connected at the bottom of the trout. So here what you are doing is a kind of a modified natural gas body. You are uh, setting the pump intake below the perforations. So fluid has to go, flow it downwards and naturally separate the gas. So this is called modified natural gas separator. Another method is this one, which is placing the pump intake uh, at the lower section of the horizontal section of the well, right? Uh, what happened with this, like I was showing in the video, sometimes you don't have uh, slug fluid, slug flow regime, but you can have stratified. Stratified means there is a division between the liquid, which is gonna be here, and the gas, which is gonna be at the top of the horizontal section, right? So when you place this intake right here and you landed that at the bottom, the lower section of the horizontal pad, uh, you can have more liquid to produce than gas. The gas is gonna be uh, flowing around the trout and then going to the angular section. So that's another advantage uh, theoretically to reduce the casing pressure, that you will allow the gas to flow um, to flow to the top section of the fluid column, right? So that's another section. That's another advantage. Uh, reducing the, like the back pressure over the gas so the gas can release. Uh, like I said before, that's, uh, that's also tricky because you can, you can increase the amount of free gas and passing from produce adds amount of free gas to produce double adds amount of free gas at your pump intake. So very careful, but still you can consider that option. So inverted trout, gas separator, modify natural gas separator, and then we can call this like a modified unconventional gas separator. Okay. Any question at this point? Uh, we're about to introduce uh, solutions available from OSI to prevent gas problem on ESP. So if there is any question, that's fine, we can talk about. If there is no, we can move forward. So using this concept, like a modified gas separator for unconventional well, we created uh, this tool. Uh, we call it the Guardian Shield. The Guardian Shield, it is a gas separator connected below uh, ESP shrouded or a ESP encapsulated. So we recommend to encapsulate from the top of the pump intake to the bottom. Something really important that we understood on the application was this space from the sensor to the bottom of the trout is very critical. So this space should be as shorter as possible. Two feet is recommended. Uh, if it's lower, I mean, it's lower is fine. The problem with this is if you left 
too much space between this area, uh, the gas is going to start releasing in this area and it's going to start to remove a uh, poor motor cooling. So it's really important to keep in mind this. Uh, okay, the gas separator is going to be connected below the truck, right? Here we have a connector uh, that is going to connect to intersection, right? And it's going to connect to separation section with a centrifugal section, right? So this is how it's going to work. Uh, the fluid is going to enter through the screens. This is proof. This is now like just ideas from OSI or any other company. Using the screens in gas separation actually helps to increase the separation efficiency because of the buffering effect. The buffering effect means uh, in this section of the screen, bubbles are going to coalesce. I mean, coalesce being they're going to join each other and become bigger. When bubble become bigger, it's easier for the bubble to flow through the liquid, right? So here is the first concept we use to separate gas, screen intake. The screen intake could be used just as an intake, or you can use the screen to filter solids. Uh, like we review in the past session, uh, solid is always a huge problem on unconventional wells because the frac sand, right? So you can start preventing those problems by using a screen with a specific slot, which is this space, to separate solid. Now, after the fluid flows through the screen, it's going to flow downwards because it is an inner tube, you can see right here, that we call the deep tube. The deep tube is going to force the fluid to go downwards, and then it's going to find the first gas separation section, which is an oversized board. The oversized body is a modified poor boy gas separator that has this reduction velocity area. So here we try to increase the annular area inside the gas separator to reduce the fluid velocity and let the gas flow upwards. So in this section between the screens and the gas separator is where most of the gas separation is going to happen. Now we have a backup system, which is the vortex uh, that is going to add as a sand separator to filter, could be small sand particles or all the sand particles if we size the screen just to be an intake and not to be a filter, right? So if all the solids are passing through the screen, they are going to be handled by the vortex. We need to make sure we have enough rod hole to place uh, the mood joints, uh, very important. Uh, the other function that we can use with the vortex is is free gas is at this point is reaching this section of the assembly. The centrifugal force is going to liquid, is going to mix it with the liquid. So when it gets into the deep tube and exit at the top, uh, we're going to have a homogeneous mix of liquid, of fluid better. So we're going to avoid the free gas to, to reach the trap. I'm going to show you a video. This is going to be more clear of how this tool is assembly and how is the flow back. Let me go back a little bit. Okay. So we have the intake system that serve could be just an intake or it could be also a filtration system. First stage is going to be this one. At this point, we can filter the medium to coarse some particles, we're talking about 300 microns, around 250 microns and bigger. Uh, the screens are connected with the dual flow system, which is a system that allows us to connect different sections with this inner tube. This is the deep tube. So the dual flow allows us to connect the inner tube and we don't have to run it on separate running. So when you are running a gas separator, this is going to be a huge advantage. They able that the fact that you are able to connect pieces, they are already pre-assembled. The gas separator, this is very important. This is going to add in two ways. First way, outside the gas separator, we have a changes in the geometry. That means we have a change on the velocity. So on the bigger size of the body, which is this one, the velocity is going to be higher, right? But then when it changes to the smaller, which is the neck, it's going to be lower right? 
So here, by increasing and changing the velocity, we are changing pressure, and then we are releasing more gas. So the idea is we have two separation sections, right? So here, fluid is gonna change velocity, it's gonna release gas, and then here is gonna happen again. So when the gas reaches the intake of the gas separator, we're gonna have a higher amount of free gas that is going to be able to flow upwards, right? Because this annular space is gonna be quite high. Uh, another advantage to reduce casing pressure if you wanna use it. So we're seeing pros and cons on that theory. Okay, let's move forward. So here we're changing area, we're changing velocity. And for instance, we're changing pressure. That's gonna happen. Inside is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a similar effect, but here the idea is to release gas in this point and then separate this gas and you can exit through the screen. Uh, the other important thing about the screen is you need to make sure the open area is quite big, right? Because it's the place where gas and liquid is gonna flow in, it's gonna flow out. So the idea is to provide as much open area as possible to remove the gas separation or, to the, or the gas to release, to get free uh, to the annular search. And this is the vortex. You, know, you guys are very familiar uh, with the separation principle of the vortex. Pretty sure Gustavo covered this very, very well. Uh, the same thing, double wall uh, with a helix that is gonna be sized based on production and the deep tube. The deep tube is a stainless steel tool that communicates the bottom of the tool with the inside of the shroud. So all the clean fluid is gonna flow upwards all the way up, all the way up until it reaches the trough. This is the trough. So with the trough, inside the trough, uh, the liquid is gonna flow. Uh, we have made several simulations and fluid velocity that we can find uh, inside the trough is between three and 2.5 feet per second. So it's a good number so we can, uh, to remove a proper cooling of the motor. Okay, so about the principles we use in this technology, we have equalizing effect on the tubing screen, the intake, agitation, the first part of the screen also, the Bernoulli effect, not only inside, but outside. Centrifugal force, which is the vortex to meet a little bit if there is any free gas at the bottom of this section of the tool and the pressure drop. That, that's gonna be maybe pressure changes uh, in the outside and inside. The outside pressure changes, uh, they are going to have a bigger effect because uh, they are gonna allow the gas to release in this point. So it's good to consider if you can recap these principles, they are physical principles and uh, they are pretty cool use in this technology. Some considerations that you need to consider um, for these two, let's say components. Mainly is going to be on the trough. And mainly is going to be if you're using this pump uh, or this system in a five and a half casing. At the beginning, when, you when we first came with this idea, uh, there was a big challenge. The challenge was um, most of the well completed, the Permian Basin are five and a half, 20 pounds. Sometimes you can find 17 pounds, but most of them five and a half, 20 pounds. So five and a half, 20 pounds means it's a huge challenge because the annular space is not big, it's actually small, and they were using 400 series pump. So the OD, if somebody knows, the OD of the motor for a 400 series pump is 4.56 inches. So the first change, that we have to do to place the trout inside a five and a half casing was actually changing the geometry of the motor. So we changed the motor from 400 to 375. That's, that's only the case if uh, the amount of fluid we're pulling, it is actually able to be pulled with this motor, right? So this is a consideration you need to check uh, with uh, the operator company. We changed the motor seal and we changed the pump intake. The pump was normal pump 400 series. 
uh, we combine this gas separator normally with upper tandem gas separator. Upper tandem are the rotary, the vortex, the one that I introduced at the first. If you see here, you can see the venting ports uh, that are gonna push, uh, push the gas outside the gas separator. And another important thing is gonna be this, this space, this space. So very important to keep in mind. So these are the main considerations. You need to make sure that the intake or the lower tandem gas separator is 338 series, seals 338, motor 375. Important thing. And this is normally how the top connection of the shroud will look like. If you see, we have here the space for the cable, the ESP cable, and there is these bolts that are gonna be holding the weight, right? Another critical thing here is consider the amount of weight holding by these bolts. So, uh, and this is always a uh, matter with the ESP. We need to keep in mind these kind of things. The weight that will be holding below the ESP is very important. Uh, some uh, ESP companies, they set the threshold like, it could be 5,000 pounds max below my ESP. Another uh, 10,000. That depends on the quality and the type of bolts they are using. This is very important. So each manufacturer company should tell you what is the max holding capacity of the bolts. That's not something that you can guess, that's something you need to ask. Uh, this is to like just check again how the changes on the area and the changes on the velocity are gonna affect uh, the separation efficiency. So here, of course, at the area number two, uh, the flow area is gonna be low, it's gonna be less, lower, right? And here it's gonna be higher. So here the fluid velocity is gonna be higher and here it's gonna be lower. So we're gonna release more gas in this kind of section. That depends always on the size of the body. This body could be three and a half, four, four and a half, five and a half. Uh, who, what's, what's gonna rule that? The casing side. As bigger the casing, uh, bigger is going to be the gas body that I can use. And of course, better is going to be my, separa my separation efficiency. Uh, so smaller the casing, the smaller is going to be the body, and lower is gonna be my efficiency. So this is the kind of correlation to keep in mind. Okay, that was everything related to the guardian shield. Any question at that point about the guardian shield? Anything you need to elaborate or maybe to recap and get more clear? No? Perfect. Okay, we are gonna use then this slide to introduce the ESP vortex regulator. Uh, the ESP vortex regulator is actually not a gas separator because it has a packer. So what happens if you separate gas below the packer? All the gas is gonna be blocked by the packer and it's not going to be able to flow upwards to the end loop, right? So with this packer, we try to restrain, to limit the capacity of the fluid to flow upwards. So this is actually a gas handler. Similar, well, not similar, it's quite different, but the concept is it is actually increase the pressure below the packer so the gas can resolubilize, right? To get back in solution. Why? Because when you increase pressure, what show, you know, you guys remember this graphic, this is the uh, gas in solution, oh, gas solubility, better. When you increase pressure, the solubility of gas increases right? And then, so it means my liquid can hold more amount of gas. So the amount of, on the opposite sense, the amount of free gas that I'm going to have a higher pressure is going to be less. So this is basically how it's going to operate. Let me play this video. So this is what happened. I know we saw at the beginning and we saw it on experience we had with, um, that's a stack, but this is what happened with the free gas flowing to the pump. Normally the pump is set right here uh, at the KOP or above the KOP, which is this point, and the free gas is creating this effect on your pump. 
So the free gas is increasing the motor temperature, producing shoot downs, right? Here you can see shoot downs. So when you when the pump shut is down, it means no production, it means no money for the operator. So that's really bad. Motor current, the same thing. Uh, you're increasing consumption. So electricity consumption is going to be higher. Uh, so if you are paying the electricity bill, you know that more consumption means more money. So the lifting cost is going to be higher. All these considerations are real. And as a production engineer, as an engineer of an operator company, you need to consider all the costs involved in operation. This is the concept behind the tool. So the vortex regulator is actually placed below the sensor with a packer. This could be a normal cup set packer, could be a triple seal packer. And below it, we have a slotted port with an oversized body in the vortex. So gas is going to flow. Then naturally, the gas will try to go to the pump. But now we have the packer. So the gas with the liquid that we have on the column is going to be forced by getting to these slots, right? It's gonna enter our tool. And at this point where the gas, the gas is locked, the volume of gas enters, our tool is gonna to be dispersed. Initially, that's where the gas is gonna be dispersed. And then when it goes down, flowing downwards, the dispersion gas or the dispersed gas is gonna reach the vortex. So you will see here the vortex is gonna do kind of a liquid, like it's gonna mix it, it's gonna change it, and then this dip tube is gonna pressurize. We're gonna increase lower diameter at this point means higher pressure. Higher pressure means uh, higher gas solubility in the liquid, and it means lower free gas. So what we are going to deliver above the packer is going to be a uh, mixed fluid, a better mix of the fluid. We're gonna produce a uh, more homogeneous fluid. This is, we can call it a homogenization tool because it homogenized. It convert, turn two phases into one phases or a bubble flow regime, which is also very good for the pump to produce. Uh, when we can expect by doing this is stable production, stable motor temperature, and more stable current consumption means that we, we can think and we can control better uh, the lifting cost, which I'm telling you before, lifting costs are very critical when you're using, for example, ESP. Uh, so this is pretty much, this is the outlet point above the packer, this point that you can see right here, uh, where the homogenized fluid is gonna to flow to the pump intake at this point. Uh, this is how the tool is made up. We have the tail joints, we need to have tail joints. Uh, we need to have uh, enough tail joints. Uh, we normally in this kind of application use three, three tail joints are more than enough. Uh, we get the vortex with the helix, which is gonna act as a mixer. And we have the oversized body with the slots. Above, we have the packer. And after the packer, we have the outlet point connected directly to the uh, ESP sensor, the motor sensor. So, okay, this is pretty much everything about the vortex regulator. The final tool that we will we are going to introduce about uh, the ESP is the ESP packet diagasifier. This is pretty much a concept. We we have this concept and it's going to be oriented more to severe uh, gassy problems. When I mean severe, we are talking about GLR above 2000, that is gonna be really difficult for a normal and standard modified pool boy gas separator, and even though it's gonna be uh, very difficult for the pump components to handle. Uh, so it's gonna be with an encapsulated pump connected with a packer type, gas separator with a packer in a descender below. So this is how the fluid is going to flow. Uh, it's going to enter the descender, flow through the packer, and then exit to the annular section. So the, the advantage of the packer type gas separator is it uses the casing annulus as a gas separator area. The gas separation depends on the geometry of the gas separator. As bigger the annular area, higher the efficiency. 
So if you use the casing as a part of your gas equator, the efficiency is gonna be maximum, right? So here you can see how the fluid is gonna exit and it's gonna reach the intake, which is at the bottom. The intake is gonna connect the deep tube to the trout and then to the pump. Uh, this is a concept we haven't done any installation so far, uh, but we have we hope to to get an installation soon uh, with this project that we are proposing for extremely severe cases of gas interference or, or gas lock in the pump. Okay, so far any questions related to gas problems in ESP or any solution that we introduce at this presentation? Okay, so I'm gonna move to the next one. So we're going to introduce briefly gas separation for rod pump. Uh, okay, in rod pump problems for uh, gas pressing, free gas, it is really very drastic. Uh, it can create the first problem that you can find is a lower or really low pump efficiency. Uh, the same thing, the amount of liquid that can be filling in a rod pump is going to be filled by gas and not for liquid. And also, all the rod strings, all these red bars that you can see here are representing the rod string, are designed to operate by pulling, right? So they are, all the rod strings are made to pull, right? not to compress. When you compress the rod string, it, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, they are gonna create friction against the tubing, the production tubing, and eventually you can create a hole in tubing. So you can break the tubing right here, or you can part the rod string. So that's another problem. And when you part the rod string, uh, well, your surface unit is gonna be just pulling the section of the rod string that it is not connected to the pump, right? So very important. First problem, lower efficiency. The gas is actually filling my pump, my pump barrel, and then it's getting into the plunger and can create gas pump, gas locking. And these two problems, gas pump and gas locking, can create hole in tubing or rod part. Two problems that they both require you to pull the wheel and these are workover expenses. Uh, okay, this is a picture of how the gas could be filling your pump. Here uh, is filling pretty much the barrel and then at the downstroke, the gas is the first fluid that is gonna flow uh, to the plunger. So very bad. This is a schematic of how the free gas is filling the pump. So at the upstroke, when the traveling valve is closed, the standing valve is gonna be open and it's gonna be filling the barrel basically with uh, gas. This red is gas. Uh, then at the downstroke, when the standing valve is closed and the traveling valve will open, uh, the traveling valve will delay in the open, right? Because uh, all that he is compressing, it is going to be gas. And when the traveling valve open, the traveling valve open when the pressure, the pressure at this chamber is going to be higher than the pressure above the valve. So at the fluid column inside the tube. So because that pressure is going to be high enough, uh, he's going to compress the gas until the point that the pressure increases and all the free gas is gonna flow. So we are just filling the plunger with free gas instead of liquid. We care to produce more liquid instead of just gas. So this is creating a delay in the opening valve, low efficiency, the same thing, higher power consumption, gas lock that can create hole in tubing or rod part, gas pounding, that means lower amount of liquid being pumped, and then eventually we're going to have a failure of the equipment. Theoretically, this is what happened. So here you can see bubble pressure, here pump inefficiency. When the pump or the well 
reaches the bubble pressure, free gas start releasing, right? If I do nothing and I have a rod pump operating in the well, uh, and I start pumping all the gas, this is what is going to happen with my pumping efficiency. As the pressure is going lower, my efficiency is going lower as well. So lower, 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 and then pretty much this is, this is going to be really bad. No, now what I have to do is separate the gas, right? I know I have free gas. I know I'm using a rod pump. So I know I have to use a gas operator or any kind of device that help me to bend the gas and prevent the gas to go inside the pump. So I can use a gas anchor, see? So if you see here, that's the effect that you can get with an effective gas anchor with means a gas operator. So if I bend the gas, I can keep uh, pretty much decent pumping efficiencies between 56 and 80, like close to 90%. If I do shift, if I do mate, to install a really efficient gas separator and bend almost 100%, that means separate 100% of the gas before it reaches the pump intake or before it reaches the pump, I'm gonna be able to achieve the maximum pump capacity. So, which is pretty much, uh, pretty much the capacity that the pump was made for, right? So recommendation, if you are using rod pump and you know that you have free gas, any amount of free gas, uh, the better thing that you can do is use a gas separator. That will give you more pumping efficiency and of course, more liquid production. So this is the first two considerations you need to think about when you're designing a gas separator. Where my pump is located at regarding my perforations. So here we will see that the perforations are above the pump. So my pump is actually set below the perforations. So what happened here is a natural gas separation, right? Natural gas separation means uh, the fluid is gonna come from the, from the perforations and I'm gonna flow downwards. The method to separate the gas is change the direction of the fluid, right? Because by gravity, fluid is gonna fall down, gas, a liquid, sorry, is going to fall down, the gas is going to flow upwards. So by changing the direction of the fluid, you are actually creating or manner to create a separation of the gas. How effective? That's going to depend on the uh, geometry of the gas separator. As bigger the gas separator, I'm going to be more efficient, okay? So here, we're creating that changes on the flow direction. And instead of flowing upwards, because the pump is below the perforations, the liquid is gonna fall down, it's gonna flow downwards, and the gas is gonna flow upwards. So this is called uh, natural gas separation. The problem with this kind of setup is gonna be solid production. Uh, by gravity, liquid is gonna fall down and solids are going to fall down as well, right? And everything is gonna go to my pump. Recommendation? use a sand control system when you are using this kind of method to separate gas, okay? Uh, theoretically, this is the most effective method to separate the gas. Uh, of course, not all the company have the ability or have the chance to set the pump below perforations. In special, when you are producing from an unconventional and a horizontal section, well, there's no way to place the pump below perforation. Uh, so this is more for conventional wells and as I mentioned before, we, you need to consider uh, sand production or solid production in this setup. Second option, uh, my pump is above perforations, which is uh, talking about the Permian Basin, uh, pretty much 99% of the well that we have at the Permian Basin are completed with the pump above perforations. Uh, so we can consider here two options. Use uh, packerless assembly, packerless gas separator or use a packer tie gas separator. That's gonna depend on the amount of gas that you are producing. And of course, the geometry of your well, the casing, uh, production tubing. So we will check this. These are in general, in a general view, considerations you need to um, think about to design a gas separator for rod pump. First, uh, like I said before, 
fluid velocity needs to be lower than uh, 0.5 feet per second. So this is the uh, this is the magic number. So it's inch per second. So theoretically, the gas is flowing at this velocity. Uh, to create like effective gas operation, you need to reduce the liquid velocity below this point. Now, this number is gonna change based on viscosity, based on density, based on the amount of gas. So typically we use six inch per second, but do not surprise anytime that you can find four or five, some operators at the Permian Basin, they use four inch per second. And that's gonna depend on the experience they have on this kind of simulation and the calibration they have made to the simulator. So just for you to keep in mind. So to calculate this fluid velocity, we'll need to consider the production volume, of course, the amount of liquid uh, and gas that you are producing. Uh, the dimension of the gas operator, very important. Uh, we are here restricted by the case inside that I told you before. Uh, as bigger the casing, we can use bigger gas operators. As smaller the casing, well, the amount, the, the geometry of the gas operator is gonna be uh, less big, so smaller. And then the fluid properties. We need to calculate or get from the PVT data, the air, the solubility, the compressibility factor, and the volumetric factor of water, oil, and gas. This is very important because you are uh, using surface condition, so you take you have to take the surface condition to the bottom hole condition. So all these PVT data should be at the bottom hole temperature at the well, right? And the PAP, very important, very important because we are gonna take everything to the pump intake condition. So this is how theoretically you have to manage to calculate this fluid velocity. So for, the, for downhole gas separation in rod pump, uh, there are different concepts that we already checked at the ESP presentation. So gravitational, like I mean, fluid needs to fall liquid so the gas can flow upwards. So reverse flow, this, that's called reverse flow. Pressure changes, like we review at the garden shield by changing the diameter, you can change velocity and you can change pressure and then you can release more gas before the intake of the gas operator. Really cool. And agitation, this is more meaning at the end of the assembly when we use the vortex and there are still some free gas flowing there and we can mix it. So we can use the vortex as a mixer and change that two phases flow for kind of a homogeneous or one phase flow for you to keep in mind. Okay, we're gonna review the type of gas separator that you can find for rod pump, and then we're gonna reuse the option we have available at OSI. So this one, we already check it, natural gas separator, means my pump is below perforations. Fluid is actually leaving the perforations and then liquid flowing downward, gas flowing upwards. Nothing weird with this, except for you need to consider sand control below the pump, so you can avoid any sand issue in your pump. Second type, modify natural gas separator. Means my pump is probably in front of above perforations, but I can extend the intake of my pump by using a deep tube or a smaller pipe diameter uh, to extend the gas separate to extend the intake below the perforations. So here is called modified natural because the pump is above perforations, but we are placing the pump intake below perforations. The same thing, liquid has to flow downwards and then gas upwards. The other is the poor boy gas potato. The poor boy is just a slotted pipe with an inner tube. And then this is typically placed above perforations. So fluid is going to flow from the perforation upward, then liquid will enter, changing the flow direction, and the gas is actually flowing upwards. This is the typical poor boy gas separator. 
The poor boy has a second version, which is the modified poor boy. Means we change the body diameter, right? Make it bigger. And then they are gonna, they, there is going to be more annular area inside the gas separator between the ID of the gas separator and the OD of the lip tube to separate gas, right? So the liquid is gonna flow upwards, then it's gonna enter the gas separator, the liquid is gonna flow downwards, and then the gas is gonna flow upwards to the casing animals. This is a second version. We use this concept in some of our gas separator. And then the fifth version, the fifth type of gas separator is going to be the packer type gas separator. So the packer type gas separator from all the gas separators using that you can use above perforation, this is the most efficient. So theoretically, the higher efficiency is going to be found in this type of gas separator. Why? Because the gas separation efficiency depends or relies on specifically the area, the annular area of your separator. In this case, we are limited by the casing, but in this case, the casing is used as the gas separator. So here, uh, okay. here, the area I am going to consider is going to be the ID, the area between the ID of the casing and the OD of the gas separator. So as bigger the casing, bigger is going to be the separation, the annular area, and uh, as a smaller is going to be my OD of my gas separator, well, higher is gonna be my area, and I'm gonna have a higher gas separation efficiency. So the problem with this is you need to consider uh, a packer. So probably you will need to use a sign control system right here, so that you can separate solid and avoid any kind of sign accumulation above the packer, which is gonna turn into a Prevalent while pulling. So that's the main thing. Okay, okay, okay. So we're going to any questions at this point. Uh, we check where the problem is coming and the solutions uh, regarding the type of gas separator we can use a drug pump. So if there is any question at this point, we can cover it or we can continue. Okay. Don't worry, guys, we are close to the end. Last pointer. Okay, so the first gas separator that we have available to produce that turning the velocity that changes in the uh, fluid direction is going to be the slurry on top, or we call it the SOT. So the SOT uses a similar concept to the one that you found on the inverted trout. Remember on ESP, when we use the trowel on the inverted version, right? So this is a similar concept. We use this slot to produce the changes in the direction. So the fluid is gonna come from the perforations upwards. Then the liquid is gonna fall like a waterfall inside the chambers. And then we're gonna separate the gas. The length of the separator is gonna depend on the pump displacement capacity. The idea with this length, with these sections is to, have clean liquid fluid, free of gas, of course, uh, inside these chambers. So the pump has free gas liquid to pull, suck, and then produce. That's the idea with the lens. So we relate the displacement capacity, right? The stroke lane, pumping speed, and pump diameter with the capacity that we are going to have on our chambers. Geometry. We have these geometries available from four inches to five and a half. What we can use is going to depend on the case in diameter. This tool can be also be combined. Well, this is a view, a more 3D view of how the intake looks like and this, the intake section. Uh, pretty cool thing about, well, all our products basically is we can play with the deep tube size. The dip tube means the inner pipe, which is uh, passing through the gas separator, and then it's gonna allow the, communi the communication between the pump 
and the gas separator. So as a smaller the lead tube, bigger is gonna be the chamber inside the gas separator and then higher the efficiency. Uh, how we can play with this? Based on the amount of fluid, uh, viscosity of the fluid, and then um, the density. So we relay, we calculate the pressure drop through the deep tube, and we determine if we can use one inch, which will be the ideal, because it will give us uh, the greater separation efficiency, or we need to use a bigger one. So that's gonna depend on the pressure drop through the deep tube. And this is the second type of gas separator. First one, slurry on top, conventional modified pour bowl. Now we have the, the second one, which is similar. And this is the original design of the garden shield. The garden shield was initially installed on um, rod pump, right? So on rod pump, we use this, this combination tool and uh, then we move it to ESP. So basically it's a combination between uh, tube and screens, it's a combination between gas bodies, uh, vortex, descender, and tail joints. Everything is gonna be connected through dual flow. So that means all the deep tube, this inner pipe is going to be pre-assembled and everything is going to be much easier to run. So this is a pretty short, but pretty cool video about this one. Let's move this a little bit so we can try this. There we go. Here we have the uh, mood joint connected to the vortex. The helix is going to be sized based on production so we can separate fine particles. We have the gas body, the oversized gas body with all the Bernoulli effect and pressure changes are going to happen outside and inside. And we have the Tiobinu screen which is gonna serve as a both intake and filtration system if that's solid is something to consider. Inside of every section, the deep tube is going to be already pre-assembled and this tool is going to be connected to the pump, the pump which is right here. So the flow path is gonna be as shown before, flow getting into the tube on the screen. So this part is actually sealed. So there is only way for the fluid to flow, which is going to be downwards, right? So all the fluid is gonna flow downwards. And if you see, this is the connection to the other side, which is gonna be at the vortex sand shield. Okay, so here we get here, that's gonna happen is coalescence and filtration, if it's, if it's wanted, uh, the filtration of the coarse and medium particles. Then we're gonna flow downwards until we reach the gas body. The same thing, we're gonna have pressure changes and velocity changes outside and inside by the Bernoulli's principle. Here, some gas is gonna be released and then the gas is gonna flow upwards and this design. And then finally, after we pass through the gas body, uh, there is the time for the vortex to centrifugate the liquid and then for the free liquid, free gas liquid flow through the deep tube. So here you see how everything, the separated or the clean liquid is flowing to the pump. And then the pump is actually producing just pure liquid, which is uh, the target uh, with this kind of separator. Okay, so it's gonna move to the next slide. This is pretty much uh, how the flow pad would look like from the horizontal section to the place. The same thing here. We can design this gas separator with different, with more than one gas body. How we determine this? Based on the pump displacement capacity, right? So we add or increase the length. So we increase retention time and we increase the amount of fluid stored in our gas separator. Uh, the same thing here with the deep tube. We can play with the deep tube and then change it based on the pressure drop through the deep tube. As smaller the deep tube is fine. The only thing is we need to make sure we are not creating a high pressure drop for the pump to overcome, which is going to be difficult uh, for the pump to overcome that. The third type, so we already checked the SO top, slurry on top, 
uh, we check the combination tool, and now we're going to show the packer type. For the packer type, remember I told you it's the most efficient gas separator at the market for gas separator installed uh, above the perforation, right? Uh, so here we have two versions of a packer type gas separator. The first version is this one. I'm going to try this right here. Let me play the video. So, this. So here uh, we have the intake below the packer. Uh, this video is showing actually a rotational packer. So we have the TAC uh, at the bottom with the rotation set packer at the top. And then above that, we have the intake section. Remember the liquid is gonna enter the pump through this point right here below. We have the center and we have the top. Now, some pretty good thing about this separator is we can customize the length of the separator. So we can decide between using 76, 96, 120 feet of this assembly. So that means the amount of clean fluid in this area is going to be bigger, right? So the same concept. We can relate the amount of liquid that we need to store in this area. We can relate it on the displays in the pump. So the fluid is gonna enter through below the packer. It's gonna flow, in this case, no inside the deep tube, but it's gonna flow around the deep tube through these uh, lower slots, right? So around the deep tube, it's gonna pass through the sections that we consider, we calculated, we need for this application, and it's gonna exit through the screen. Now we have two versions for this packer type. We have a screen version like this, and we have a slot version. Slots mean just typical slots that are distributed at the top of the body. But okay, let's keep continue with this explanation. So here is where the fluid is gonna exit. So before we use the screen as an intake, now we're gonna use the screen as an exit point. We're exiting the gas separator, we're flowing downward through the annulus, through the casing annulus, and then we're entering the pump through the lower section of the gas separator. We have two intakes, one each side, uh, 180 degrees separation, and is flowing directly to the pump. So why is this most, like, more efficient than other designs? Because the annular area is gonna be bigger, okay? Okay, so we can stop here and we can move forward here. Uh, this is the second version I told you, one with the screen and one with the slots. Uh, typically we use just, and for this kind of setup, uh, deep to one inch, an inch and a quarter, which are the most typical that you can find. And um, here the most important is the size of this screen. So typically the lower diameter that you can run on a wheel was 2.38. So, Theoretically, this dimension was the most efficient gas separator. 217A is a little bit bigger, so it means the annular area is a little bit smaller, right? A little bit smaller, not too much. Now, we start thinking about the option to optimize this and make it smaller. Make it smaller without affecting or without impacting on any way on the separation, on the pump uh, capacity or the pressure drop or yeah, the resistance of the tool because lower diameter typically means that you're going to have less tensile strength, uh, less mechanical properties, right? That's like the belief on the people when you think on a smaller diameter, you think inch and a half, inch and a quarter, two and three inches, okay, they are maybe weaker than bigger assemblies. So we finally came out with this pretty good tool, which is the innovation behind the gas separator. So we use the gas separator and we reduce the neck of the tool. We make it smaller. And now we are using a 1.89 inches OD. So before you were comparing the case in ID with minimum 2.38, which is 2.375. And now you are comparing the case in ID with 1.89, which is pretty much 
like sig a significant reduction. Now, the same thing I told you before. The concern is going to be resistance, right? So we manner to use a thicker, really thick wall tube, which is this one. The 1.82 has a wall thickness of 0.4 inches. That's very significant. This is the comparison of a normal 2138 tubing. It has a wall of 2.0.217. And here you got 0.4. So we're almost doubling uh, the thickness of the 2138, and even almost doubling the thickness of the 2178. So this wall thickness is very significant. And they gave us a tensile strain of 72,000 PSI. So it means below this packer, we have the option to run mechanical packer, rotational packer, or just a cup packer. We normally uh, have this tool designed with a triple C packer and a D sander below it. So the flow path is gonna be similar. Fluid is gonna flow through the D sander first, then it's gonna pass through the packer around the DT, remember? And it's gonna exit through the smaller neck right here. So here is where the magic happened, uh, where the mass, the massive gas separation is gonna happen. And then the fluid is gonna flow down, downwards after it passes through this section. Uh, enter the pump through these slots. Uh, mechanical properties are really significant. We use typically cup packer HMBR, which is a, specifically made for uh, resistant to sand erosion, but also we can use Aflas, Viton, another material that actually are going to provide resistance against temperature and some uh, gas, gas like H2S or CO2, that's pretty much. So this is the new innovation. This, this is actually uh, like changing the perception of the packer tie and changing the threshold, the limits than we had for, for this technology. Uh, finally, uh, the last two tools, we have this, the chamber type gas separator. The chamber type uses two independents. Listen carefully, these are independent separation chamber. So actually we are splitting production in two chambers. Uh, productions are actually distributed 40-60%. We made a CFD simulation on SOLIDWORKS and another flow dynamic simulator. And we determined uh, the fluid is gonna flow 40 to 60%, 40 in the first chamber, 60% in the second chamber based on the open area. And then, so we are distributing the production and we are increasing efficiency. Uh, this gas separator has a separation efficiency close to the packer type. It's not the same, but it's close. Uh, so this product, actually this solution is made for clients, for a customer, for operator that doesn't like to run packers because that's something that you can find. People who are not interested in running packers, you can use this tool. Uh, it's a packerless gas separator, no packer, and you can combine it as a different, uh, with a similar, you can relate it with a similar separation efficiency. And now we have the gas vent DC. This is the final product. Uh, this is not actually a gas separator properly. Uh, this is more a component uh, that we add for customers that like to run the TAC below the setting nipple. Most of our customers, they use the TAC above the setting nipple, three to five joints above the setting nipple. Uh, but there are some customers, mainly in the Balkan and North Dakota, they use the TAC below the setting nipple. So what happened with the TAC is the TAC is big, you know, it's super big. And I'm gonna show you here uh, the open area you're going to have. Here you can see the annular area that a regular TAC offer you in a five and a half case in 20 pounds. So the annular area that you will have is 0.96 square inches. That's smaller. So the fluid have to go through this the blue section, which is the open area that this kind of TAC will offer you. And also if you are using a gas separator below the TAC, the gas have to flow through this, through the same area. So it's going to be very difficult. 
So we came with a solution to use the annular area inside uh, the TAC to increase this. And we developed the gas vein TAC. So the gas vein TAC is actually placed below the setting nipple. And this is how the regular TAC is gonna look like. So it's gonna be very stacked. Now we change it and we add a communication between the bottom and the top, similar, let's say to the packer. Imagine this is a packer and there is a restriction. So we use the inside and we send the gas through this intersection. So the gas actually is gonna flow after we separate the gas. Just think about it that we have a gas separator right here. So we separate the gas and instead of using just this area, that is the one that the regular TAC uses normally, we're using the same area plus this angular area. This angular area. This deep tube is going to be a communication between the gas separator and the pump. So the pump, the gas separator is going to discharge the fluid inside the deep tube and then it's gonna flow to the pump. And we're using that annular space inside the TAC to remove the, ga the gas venting so the gas can flow to the annular section. Uh, this is an schematic, how regular, what you just saw the video, uh, gas separator set below the TAC and the pump. Regular TAC will create like a gas pocket. That's something we call a gas pocket uh, below the TAC. And the gas vein THC will create a secondary path, an additional path for the fluid to go and be vented, for the liquid, sorry, to be vented. The liquid is going to be discharged through the deep tube. So here we have the gas separator. Uh, the liquid is going to flow inside the deep tube, then passing inside the deep tube of the gas vein as well, and then reaches the pump. That's a pretty elegant solution we found to overcome. And then the increases in the open area is significant. For example, in the regular TAC, we pass from 0.96 to 3.37 square inches. So it was 250% of more open area. In the, in the sling gas band TAC, which is another type of TAC, uh, we pass it from 4.7 square inches to 6.28 square inches. So 34% uh, percent of more open area. So that's pretty much uh, a huge increase in for the gas main. Okay, guys, I think this is all I got for you. Sorry, I get a little bit longer than expected, uh, but I hope this information um, it will be very useful uh, for your future careers and for the current applications you may be uh, deploying or using in the whole industry. So thank you very much. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer anything. Is there any questions or everything was clear? That, that's fabulous as well. I guess there is no questions. Cool. So well, again, thank you very much. Uh, you can find my contact information on LinkedIn or at OSI website. Uh, if you have any further question or any additional information you want to elaborate on, uh, I'll be more than happy to help, okay? So thank you very much and hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Thank you.